and I saw the, the input and the output of both of their professions. My mother's input and her output as a government employee yeah. and my father's input and his output as a business owner. Yeah. And I was like, I want to be here. <laughs> <laughs> the business side. Nathan Klassen, thank you so much for coming on Africa Speak. Maybe I will just give you an opportunity for you to actually introduce yourself to the audience. Cool, thanks for having me. Uh, I am Nathan Klassen from South Africa originally. And the reason why I came to Namibia mm. was because I married a Namibian woman <laughs> and I started a family here. Mm. So, and then I also moved my financial business to Namibia. Mm. So that's how I ended up here and I've been loving it so far. Okay. So it's actually great to hear that you've been loving Namibia. So you being a financial advisor and being in the financial um, world, you know, there's this famous saying that money is the root of all evil. So what is your take on that? So <laughs> I agree 100%. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> um, I, I grew up with that belief mm. most of my life, mm. uh, thinking that it's wrong to have uh, money. Mm. And I always thought that those who have money uh, was doing something illegal. Mm. So I had that kind of belief system growing up. But later on, I came to realize that uh, it's not actually true. Because I think the, the saying comes from um, scripture that says money is the root of all evil. Mm. But if you look at it closely, it says the love of money is the root of all evil. Ah. And money itself is a tool. And depending on in whose hands you find it, it can either be used for evil or it can be used for, for good. So, yeah, that's, that's my take on it. I, I disagree with the statement that money is e evil. Mm. Um, but I do say that depending on in whose hands it is, yeah. either makes it good or evil. And if you look at the world and our experiences, I would say um, people have used money for their own benefit mm. and it actually affected other people negatively. Mm. So that could also be influencing or supporting that belief system. I see, I see. Yeah. So what would you say maybe to people who see wealth and success from a negative kind of light? Well, my, what I have done mm. or what I try to do is to show the other side of the coin. Because um, I was exposed to both sides of the mm. situation. I had a negative perspective of money or wealth, now I have a positive perspective. So what I tend to do is to try and show how it can benefit our loved ones and our generations to come. Mm. So currently my response when I'm in, you know, wherever you meet many people and yeah. these topics come up, then I would say, but are you aware of this benefit? Are you aware of this? And slowly but surely, there are people who are becoming more aware of the, the positive side of money mm. and, and also understand how it can benefit themselves and their family and their future generations to come. Yeah, that's actually true. And, and I think Africa, in Africa and maybe on, like on, on the global stage as well, we also, we, there are so many misconceptions when it comes to money. Mm. What are some misconceptions, misconceptions that you can, maybe came mm. across? being in this field? Well, I think there's quite a lot, mm. but one that I think is most um, like holding us back as Africans yeah. is the, the misconception that you have to leave your hometown or your country uh, to make it, to be successful. For example, I, came from, I come from Cape Town, mm. And in Cape Town, people always said, ah, I need to go to Johannesburg. Because in Johannesburg is where you can make money. Mm -hmm. and, and then when I was working in Johannesburg, and then they would say, no, I must go abroad. I must go to America. <laughs> and then um, when, I, when, when, I, when I spend time abroad as well, mm -hmm. then people were saying, ah, no, you must go to Dubai. Oh, <laughs> <Dubai's>. <laughs> 
So there's this misconception that you have to leave your hometown mm. to be successful. Yeah. But if you look at those who were successful, who are successful, um, I think we can refer to our our brother in mm. SA, Trevor mm. Noah. Mm. Where did he start? He started in SA. Yeah. And then he made the connections and got the opportunity to go abroad. Yeah. Where he's absolutely flourishing. And that he didn't wait until I leave, but he started where he was. And that gave him the, the foundation to make use of those opportunities abroad. So I think the, the misconception is that I need to leave to, to be successful. Yeah, that's very true. But I think if you start now, wherever you are, township, uh, um, in a school, at home, university, in your current employment, mm. just start and then you'll be able to see the different uh, opportunities that, pr that present itself. Yeah, that's actually yeah. true. Because even me growing up, I think everybody, every African's dream is to actually move abroad. Yeah. And you think that like once you like just get an opportunity and you find yourself maybe in the UK or anywhere, mm. then I don't know, like there are just like jobs available or like opportunities <laughs> available that you can just get like that. Yeah. But now I actually also have like, I think a different perspective mm -hmm. that there are actually more opportunities here as well. Yeah. And you going there does not guarantee you success as yeah. well. On that, mm -hmm. people abroad are looking for developing markets. Mm -hmm. So Africans or those that I have engaged, they want to travel abroad for opportunities. But the people abroad want to come and make use of the opportunities in Africa. In Africa. <laughs> So, <laughs> so I think we have a very big advantage as Africans mm. being on this continent, having the, the, the resources and the know-how right here in front of us. Yeah. So I think we should utilize that. That's very true. Um, let's just move on to the industry and the trends, like the trend in the industry. So what are, what are some of the trends that you're actually seeing now in the financial space, mm -hmm. especially with the rise of technology and the robo-advices? Oh, it's, it's really affecting um, the financial industry. Mm. I think in, in Africa, what I have noticed, and I've spoken to a few uh, advisors in the UK, yeah. America, and Dubai, and so forth. And with ChatGPT, mm -hmm. this is like the trend that's coming up. ChatGPT automation, so businesses are incorporating AI in their business processes. Yeah. And in addition to incorporating the business, the AI into business processes, yeah. they also have like automations where it takes away the need for, for the business to depend upon a human being, mm -hmm. essentially. So you can have a one, one person business, there's this, this term that's um, quite popular mm -hmm. abroad, the one person, the solopreneur, or the one person business model, where it's the one individual and all he has around him is systems. The moment that you click on the website, you type in something, it, it gives you automatic response, it leads you to the next step within the funnel and then it gives you your whatever you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And only if you need to, to reach out to someone where the system hasn't developed to tend to that need, yeah. then you get referred to the person. So in terms of trends, AI automation, um, it is taking over or it is being implemented within the financial industry quite fast. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just a matter of time until we here in the African continent also um, are going to be adopting that. I think first we'll be using it mm -hmm. and then we'll understand the value and then we'll be adopting oh, it. As so we haven't adopted yet, it yet? Right? Not yet. Uh -huh. uh, it's... Uh, it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. And I believe um, it will provide us with the opportunity to look at, um, at different ways how we're going to develop uh -huh. in, 
in the financial sector. sector. Okay, I see. I'm actually now curious to know, like, where did your journey in the financial sector actually started? Were you mm. born like in the like in the, in the family where people mm -hmm. were involved in the financial sector or anything? Or like where, does they, where did the inspiration actually come from? Sure, it's a... Uh, I think this question touches deep into my childhood. Okay. <laughs> so I came from... I come from a background um, where we didn't have much. I think you'll, you'll find that a similar trait uh, across um, people maybe in finance. Uh, or business owners. Mm -hmm. or, so I come from a background where we didn't have a lot, we just had enough, sometimes not even enough. And that instilled in me the desire to understand money. Because mm -hmm. if I am lacking something, then in order to have it, I want to understand it. So which led me to look into finance and how does, what is money, how does money work, how does it flow within society and how can I position myself so that I can also never be in that position that I was mm -hmm. before. So it stemmed from a, like a bitter mm. childhood, yeah. but at the same time, um, this is not a reflection on my parents by nature, but it's just they did the best they could, but they also did not understand money and how it worked. Uh, so that's where I... That's where the desire to go into finance came from. came from. And in addition to that, mm. my father was also a business owner. So I grew up seeing him manage uh, his business and my mom was a teacher. So on the one hand, I had a mother who was a teacher mm. and a father who was a business owner. And I mm. saw the, the input and the output of both of their professions. My mother's input and her output as a government employee yeah. and my father's input and his output as a business owner. And I was like, I want to be here. <laughs> At the business side. <laughs> yes. So it was both finance and business that, that basically laid the foundation for me to become a financial advisor mm -hmm. um, to the point where today, I, in terms of giving advice and helping people financially, I would say I am more equipped to work with business owners and how to manage a business's finance mm -hmm. and prepare them and their families for building wealth. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, okay, that's quite, where it comes yeah, from. Quite interesting. So what did you say is one of the most rewarding um, aspect of your career? I would say that Peace of mind. Mm, okay. <laughs> um, I think I, I'm sure yourself and our viewers will relate. It's very disturbing if you are worrying about finances, worrying about money. Where is your next meal going to come from? How are you going to pay your rent? Um, we're just living paycheck to paycheck, essentially. So. The most rewarding thing for me personally is that I understand how money works and I also have peace of mind um, financially. I'm not as stressed out and as worried as before. And at the same time, uh, it's also rewarding to see those that I help have a, peace, a sense of peace, mm -hmm. knowing that I'm not, I'm, I've put something in place, mm. my kids are going to be sorted. My, if anything happens to my car, mm. to my house, to my business, I'm fine. Because mm -hmm. there's many stories of business owners that were doing very well, but then they lost everything. And then they had to rebuild from the beginning. So it's very rewarding for myself knowing that I, I have a plan for myself and my family. Mm and that peace of mind and also to assist others to have that same peace of mind through making the necessary provisions. Uh -huh. Do you need to have a lot of money for you to have a peace of mind? Or like how can you kind of like attain that peace of mind? You don't need a lot of money. Mm. It's what we do with the money we have that can provide us peace of mind. Um, if I can be very specific, yeah. for example, 
What worries me as a husband and a father mm. is my family's well-being. And they, there's like three, from my personal perspective, there's three levels in terms of, three to four levels in terms of building wealth. There's the risk aspect, mm. which is insurance. And then there is the investment aspect. It's where you are saving and investing. Yeah. And then the third aspect is like managing your wealth, essentially. So peace of mind comes from having, taking, the, taking care of the possible risks. If anything happens, if I pass away, then because I have the necessary provisions in place, my family will be taken care of. Taken care. Uh -huh. They won't have to worry about the funeral costs or they'll, they'll they'll have enough to sustain themselves for quite some time. Um, I have my son's uh, study plan is also in place. Hmm. So I have what puts me at peace is knowing that my wife and my son from a financial perspective will be taken care of if anything happens to me. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to earn millions to do that, but at any level you are able to to do that, you can start doing that. Mm -hmm. Quite interesting. What do you say are some of the foundational, like financial principles that one should follow for regardless of the income level or the location where you are actually based as well? Mm -hmm. I think key point regardless of the income level, mm -hmm. some, some income levels you're living from hand to mouth. Mm -hmm. So we don't have much options if we are at that stage. And I think many of us can like testify that's not a nice stage to be in survival mode. Um, even in survival mode or the mid to high level income, I would say uh, normally people say save, you must save, you must save. Yeah. However, I would say you should invest in yourself because the amount of income financially that you can bring in in the economy is dependent upon your value that you have made available to the economy. So I would say whether you are a student, you just started your career mid or wherever it may be, investing in oneself to make you more valuable so that when you position yourself in the market, you can then receive compensation in relation to your value. Mm -hmm. So I would say investing in oneself is something you can do even if you do not have a job, even if you have no income, mm -hmm. you can start doing you that. Start and that with. should continue even if you are mid, even more so at a high income level. Okay. And in the aspect of location, like where, does that matter as well where you are? Location, I would say it's a factor. Um, if you're a factor, yeah. which also depends upon your needs, if you want to be a, a billionaire, for example, yeah. then you're going to need to position yourself in the market where you can provide that value. And that may require you to move location. If you are in a small town where there's not much flow of money, mm. then you'll need to leave that if your goal is there. If, like to be extremely high net worth. Mm. However, if your goal is to feed your family, if, if your goal is to feed your family, um, study, buy a house, then in any community, you are, I, th I believe and I've seen, you are able to do that. Mm -hmm. Because there's enough money flowing within the community that you can provide value so that you are able to set yourself up. To set yourself up, so, I see. Yeah. And what do you say are some of the biggest uh, mistakes of, like, yeah, mistakes that we do, especially maybe when it comes to finance, mm -hmm. especially in Africa as well, and how can we avoid them? Oh, um, <laughs> I think I'm going to touch on many, yeah. like maybe it may be a bit sensitive. Please just. <laughs> so when I think myself too, the first time I got like money more than I was able, more than covered my expenses, um, I immediately began buying the nice phone, um, buying two cars, uh, getting the flat and that, I think, is the biggest mistake. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Like taking that money and spending it on things that does not help you put you in a better situation financially. So it takes, it robs you from where you can be in a year's time. That same 500,000 or 100,000 or 50,000 mm-hmm. or 20,000, doesn't matter what amount it is, if it is used in a wise way, you will be in a better position in the next six months, a year, two years time. Mm-hmm. When you, you can have a bit more assets that you can then buy all the other things. Mm-hmm. So it's, I would say it's a mistake because looking back at our, if you ask someone that's older, even if I ask myself mm-hmm. 10, 15, 20 years ago, I, w- I would tell myself I should have rather taken that 4,000, 5,000 payment mm. at that like 10 years ago and I'd rather put it into an investment um, either onshore or offshore okay. and I wouldn't have to be working anymore. Does it make sense? Yeah, it does. It does actually. But I think like it also has to do with I don't know. Like sometimes if you get money, you kind of want to fulfill your emotions that time, mm. or like you just want to satisfy yourself. Yeah. So you can buy whatever you need. And sometimes like if you get money, the brain just goes blank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a what you're touching on now is money psychology. It's like the the perspective of money we have today based upon our upbringing it's like i always felt i worked hard i need to reward myself it's like i felt like i owed it to myself Um, later on when traveling abroad and so forth i got exposed to a different um, mindset Mm. a different belief system that i can still pay myself reward myself by investing in myself or keeping my investments for my family kind of thing yeah. so I would definitely say yes we do grow up with that mindset I must reward myself however thinking long term can help us um, change that it's a, yeah it's actually yeah so how do you help clients um, balance their short-term financial needs with long-term goals like retirement considering Mm. economic challenges that we have like within the continent Mm. I would say it's the same approach with any individual who has short-term and long-term goals Um, you work on them both at the same time Mm. you don't focus only on the short term or on the long term, yeah. but you kind of work at them together. For example, if you want a nice six pack or nice arms, you're gonna to go to the gym, it's a long term thing you're working for. But short term, you need to finish your assignment, you're gonna get it done today. Yeah. So in one day or one week rather, you find time for both. So when it comes to retirement and buying a house mm. and buying a car, I would say you allocate a certain percentage of your income to retirement, to buying the, your home deposit mm. and to your, your car payment. So depending on what, how much you want to retire with, what car you want to drive and what house you want to live in, that will depend obviously based upon your income and how much you can qualify for. But the principle is work on long, medium and short at the same time, mm. incrementally. Because if it, when it compounds, you will find you are far more better off than when you're only focused on the short term, short term, mm-hmm. and then focus on medium term, and then you forget about short term. So I would say having a plan where you are a practical plan according to what you can afford, mm-hmm. that will enable that you are able to achieve short, medium, and long-term goals. Term goals. So, but what institutions or what platforms do we actually use to come up with these, um, these plans, the retirement mm. plans and all that? Or is it something that you can do with the bank? You can. The banks recently have come up with their own uh, financial products and advice. Mm. So you can. However, in terms of financial planning itself, there are there's a financial planning um, sector where you'll find many financial advisors it's quite a lot of 
um, designations, you'll find a chartered financial planner, you'll find a uh, wealth manager, you will find a um, financial advisor. So all of these people that are in the financial industry working with clients in, in, when it comes to financial planning, they can assist you in making that plan. Mm -hmm. the, the banks recently, I am not sure, I'm sure someone from the banks will be able to share more. Uh, they have, they do also provide in terms of insurances these mm. days. But in terms of the financial planning, short, medium, long term, currently I'm not aware if they are able to make that plan for the, for for the uh, clients. Yeah. Okay, I see. So, like, you, you know, in Africa, let me say many African, Af African families, actually, we, I think we prioritize more when it comes to supporting our families mm. rather than investing in ourselves and creating, actually, wealth. So, like, what do you, like, maybe what is, how can we individually, like, as individuals, how can we balance that? Mm. When you say supporting our family, yeah. are you talking about black tax? Yeah, black tax. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, so as a colored person, um, I, our family dynamic was very different. Mm -hmm. um, but I married an African woman. Yeah. And this from was the when. North. From the north. <laughs> <laughs> this was when mm -hmm. I um, became more aware of the belief and the concept of black tax. Mm -hmm. um, so it was. Even though back in South Africa, having elders, we always try to provide as much as possible. But I think coming to Namibia, it, it's more stronger, the belief of the yeah. obligation towards the family. And even my friends and family and colleagues, that it's, it's, it's just part of our, it's just an expectation you yeah. have to meet. Mm. Um, my perspective of it is that if myself today I have a difficulty or a challenge with black tax mm -hmm. or um, paying, helping my parents and so forth, yes, I, if they are in need of funds, then I feel obligated to help. Mm -hmm. Like I, I feel yeah. like I, if they don't have anything to eat or to drink or electricity, yeah. what yeah. things have to be taken care of, then I feel obligated to help. Um, at the same, because they were there, I'm, I'm the offspring. Yeah. So there's this, this, the sense of duty I feel towards them. Yeah. But in the same breath, I don't want to put that expectation or obligation on my child, my son. <laughs> so then my perspective personally is that I need to make the provisions so that I am not financially dependent on my son in the next 15, 20, 30 years. I see. So at the same time, yes, paying back, um, but at, in the same breath, yeah. making sure that it doesn't continue like this cycle it's going sad, forward. Yeah. It's, it's obviously going to be difficult because you are going to make enemies within like within the process as well. Because one thing I think about our black family, especially from the north, I can speak for the people from mm -hmm. the north because we have like big extended families. And mm -hmm. if you are known as that person who is like, I stick on my budget, if you're not part of my budget, mm -hmm. you are seen as stingy and you are being called, ah, you think you are a white person. Mm -hmm. That's a white person in a black color or something mm -hmm. like that. That's how you are kind of like labeled. Yeah. Within that. So I, I would say it's a tricky situation. As you said, you'll make enemies. Mm. But I believe, or my response would be, is to communicate and say, listen, um, fam, this is my situation. Yeah. And this is how much I can afford. Yeah. And this is my plan for the future. And this is important to me. Yeah. And this is all I can do. It may not yes. be... Uh, approved or yeah, liked upon yeah. but at the end of the day, the responsibility is on me to make sure that my family yeah so how can as families maybe plan for their children's education and future needs you know mm. i would say that firstly seeking the guidance um as a example if you have a 
a mine worker. The mine worker's profession is to work in the mine. Their profession is not finances or the plan. So if you are sick, where would you go? To a doctor. doctor yeah. If your tooth is aching, go to a dentist. dentist yeah. If your finances are paining, go to a financial <laughs> advisor um, to help you with that problem. So I would say seeking the guidance from accredited, qualified, experienced financial advisors or planners or wealth managers, someone in the financial sector um, may be in a better position to advise. Um, so I think how, first how to go about it from to plan for your family is to seek the necessary advice and guidance mm -hmm. and then follow that as far as you can. Implement it. And as you are implementing the plan, look for better advice somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I mm. see. So where do we find now people like you or what institutions can we actually maybe approach for mm. us to get those better, like to get those financial advice? So there are numerous financial institutions, like I spent a lot of years at Old Mutual, mm. and then my aunt and family was also at Sunlam, mm. and then a colleague of mine was at Santam, mm. uh, as like short term. So the insurance and the institutions are those who can provide the necessary guidance in terms of um, how to make a plan. Um, so I would advise your viewers or even yourself, yeah. myself, my family, whoever your financial advisor may be, whether it, you've spoken to them a month ago, six months ago, a year ago, reach out to them and say, this is my, my plan, my problem. I need, like, how am I going to pay for my child's study in the next 10 years? Um, if you look at the prices of education now mm. and you look at the in yearly increase, how much will it be? Mm. Work your way back. So I would say um, there are various institutions, even if you just Google financial advisor um, Ventuk, then you will see many people. Uh, if you go to Independence Avenue or any main city, mm. you will find those institutions that are, are there. Yeah. Uh, Sanlam or Mutual. Um, and there's quite a lot of them and what the another option is brokerages mm. like I have joined a brokerage mm. which means that I am able to provide the clients with options financial planning options from Old Mutual from Momentum from Sunlum from Santam from Hollard and the array of different financial planning vehicles to help protect and get them to where they need to be. So it's up to the client, I would, whether it be Old Mutual, Sunla, Momentum, Hollywood, whoever it may be, mm. just go and speak to someone, just to get the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. And then like, as time progresses, then you are able to refine the guidance that you receive. Mm -hmm. A little bit of guidance is better than no guidance at all. Good. So find the closest financial institution, go there, seek for the guidance. And if you want a broad view, mm. then I would say find a brokerage who can then present to you options from all the insurance companies. Mm -hmm. And you will have a way, you will have a informed, you'll be able, you'll have the information to make an informed decision. But any guidance, mm -hmm. any financial guidance is better than no financial yeah, guidance. That's actually true. Okay, I actually want us to move to student finance because mm -hmm. I think like being a student, that's the way like I think you start having like a lot of money, mm -hmm. um, especially in Namibia and you don't have any financial background as mm. well, maybe sometimes. So what advice would you give to students that are operating on a tight budget, or especially those ones that are relying on loans? Mm. Tricky situation. Um, I remember, I'm sure many people can relate, the mm. moment that you get that money and you go to university, mm. you buy whatever you want, and then you just eat wheat picks for the next <laughs> Kind of thing. <laughs> so I would say that um, to be wise, mm. firstly to be informed. Yeah. Um, I know of many students 
when the money comes in, they they spend everything and they just live on peanuts. Mm. So I would say first and foremost to be in, informed, educate yourself, understand what options are there, uh, and that is seeking financial guidance first and foremost, and then. Depending on the amount that you get or whatever it may be, then find a, have a plan. If my expenses for the year or for the or the six months is mm -hmm. this much, break it down and keep it stored away, mm -hmm. so that you don't have to go and knock on people's doors and say, "Listen, um, I need this, I need that, I need that." Yeah. Then what that will do, putting money away and living off what you need to, it's difficult because you have to resist the temptation of your desire mm -hmm. in the present tense. However, it takes you out of survival mode. And survival mode is a very ugly place to be mm -hmm. because you only think about short term. You're only thinking about now, yeah. but you're not thinking about three, six. And mm -hmm. the, the best things or the, the greatest return comes from the long term investments. So if you can get out of, um, as a student even, mm. um, out of survival mode and you are able to adjust your mind to medium and long term, mm. you will begin making the necessary investments, whether it be in education or time or relationships, that you will reap a, a crazy reward from later. Mm -hmm. So as, as a student, how can maybe I start building my financial um, you know, how can I start building my financial foundations maybe mm. while I'm still studying? Education. <laughs> Not <laughs> Ministry of Education. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, educating myself financially. Um, I don't know if you've heard about stories where millionaires and billionaires, they lost their fortune. And then within three years, they are back where they mm -hmm. were before. Yeah. The reason why they are able to do that is because they have the knowledge, the mindset and the skill set to get back to where they need to be. So where, even if it's a student who doesn't have a lot of money, mm. when that student with the mindset and the skill set gets money, mm. then they'll be able to make more of it. So I would say starting off, um, Develop the mind, know where you want to go, what the goal is, develop the mindset and the skill set to get there. Mm -hmm. And even if you lose everything, you will be able to rebuild, to rebuild. from there on forward. Yeah, that's actually, I, I remember last year we actually had one of the guests here who's, who owns the restaurant, one of the famous restaurants mm. in Mendo Parin Katutura, and she started with NASAF. Mm. She started her funds, the money that she received from the loan, mm. that's how she started her business while she was a student. And yeah. today she's like a successful lady. Yeah, I would say there's something that if, you, if she had to be in the same situation, mm. then she could do it again. But if you take, give someone else that same money, it may just yeah. go to waste. Mm. I hear about credits, but I'm not even sure what credits mm. are and, and, you know, also debt. So what should students maybe know about building credits and avoiding debt traps early in their life, especially in the African context um, mm. where credit systems may differ? Well, I would say you have to be very selective on the debt or the credit that you take. Um, there are, for example, um, yes, we do find ourselves in tight situations, mm -hmm. but some, sometimes it's better to just bite down and suffer in the short term mm -hmm. than to take out a loan or borrow money or get a credit card if your expenses is more than your income, you're going to find yourself in a situation where you have to get a loan or get a credit card. And that kind of credit or debt does not help because of the interest and compounding over time. You're digging yourself in a hole and your income is remaining the same. So I would say, um, be very selective on the type of credit that you get. Mm -hmm. And debt is not good or bad. It depends on what you use it for. 
Yeah. Like the story you just mentioned yeah. about the restaurant lady, she, she got money and she was able to make a successful business. Well, there are businesses or business owners that also get credit from the bank. And because they have a plan, they have an idea and they are willing to work, then they, are, they use that credit and debt to put them in a better position financially. But if someone does not have that plan, the, the knowledge of how to do that, or the guidance, mm. then that debt can put them in a... Yes, uh -huh. which can affect their credit record badly in the future. When they want to buy a house, then they have this um, defaults and judgments against them that makes it difficult to qualify for a, house. for a house. So I would say be very selective and use it to help you in the long term and not for short term mm -hmm. like gain. Gain, I see. Like in terms of student loans, are those like bad debts or in that can it impact you after you are done with your studies? Mm -hmm. In terms if you want to start maybe buy a house, buy a car, anything mm -hmm. like that? I think it Depending on your debt management, mm. it can either affect you positively or negatively. Mm -hmm. So I know of many students that took out a study loan and they paid it off consistently and that was seen as this person is trustworthy. They can, they, this, this speaks to the, the type of person so we see, okay, now we can definitely give this person more credit. More credit. Huh? Um, but, uh, same situation if the credit is not managed payments not made on time and then that same credit or debt can that student loan mm -hmm. can be seen as a a negative impact then that that person may be seen as like worse off mm -hmm. like the banks wouldn't want to lend this person money because of that management okay that is sure makes sense okay so i want us to move to the patient funds and retirement mm. plans so um why is it important for one to start contributing to your retirement plan early especially in countries mm. like where social safety net may be limited mm. i if i look at our older generation mm. And coming back to the, the black tax conversation, yeah. um, if we are able to invest in our retirement funds from a young age mm. and it grows over time, depending on the vehicle that you put it in, you would be in a much better position financially to take care of yourself and your generations to come. So. My, and my perspective of why it's important is because it will put me in a better position myself and my family for the future, mm -hmm. um, primarily. Uh, if, and if I don't do it, then I will need to be knocking on doors. I will need to be saying, I, am, I need help with this. I, and I will become a... Um, it will be very difficult for my kids mm to build their lives um, if they still have to support me. Mm. Now they must support me and their kids at the same time. Yes, there are situations we need to do that. However, the mindset and the intention should be to how do I put my kids in a better position than what I had? And retirement planning is a key part of um, putting our generations in a better position. Mm -hmm. I know of people who they were born into money mm -hmm. and not because their parents had money, but because their parents took the retirement and financial planning serious. So which put them in a position where they can focus on things that they want to do mm -hmm. as opposed to living hand to mouth what I need to do to survive. Oh. So the impact, of the, the impact of financial planning is generational. Okay, I see. So like, can I start with a, a retirement plan while I earn a little or I don't maybe have like a consistent kind of job? Mm. Or like how, like, or does it have a limit, limit, limit? Mm. You can start anytime. 
as long as you have an income, you can start off with a few hundred mm -hmm. Namibian dollars. What did you have? Yeah, I started off with, I think it was 500 Namibian dollars. Mm -hmm. And then over time, I would increase. But looking at it now, I'm like, yeah, I'm glad I started. Because if I started when I was ready, mm -hmm. then I wouldn't have benefited from compound interest. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have saved up how much I saved already. So you can start off at any income bracket, even if it is little, a few hundred dollars, and then increase over time. Mm -hmm. And what will, what, what will, how, what made it um, kind of, um, how sure I am that this will actually work and I won't change one day to go, can I, can, can't I go back and kind of like withdraw the money back, not take the money out? Um, so if you are concerned about the, the nature of retirement annuity, mm -hmm. I would then say rather put it into a, like a fixed term investment, 10 years, 15 years, then you can still have, you can get it in 10 or 15 years, whichever one you take and not at retirement. Mm -hmm. The principle of say, like putting money away mm -hmm. is what I believe we need to adopt. Even if you feel that five, 10 years is too long, then put it into a flexible savings. So if anything happens in six months or a year, you have access to it. But do not break the habit of doing that. Yeah. I've seen people who have money in a retirement annuity, but I've seen people with more money in a flexible investment. So they were in a better position than the one who had a retirement annuity mm -hmm. because they were consistent and the amount they put in was more than the amount in the retirement annuity. Mm -hmm. So the vehicle may change, but the principle remains the same, thinking about the future and preparing today. today. So what do you say are some of the challenges that maybe we face when it comes to retirement plans and uh, patient funds and all that, and how mm. can we overcome it, especially in our context? Mm. I think our challenge is um, not knowing. Like, if you don't know how important something is, mm. then you won't take action. Um, I was in that same position. Mm. I didn't know the importance of financial planning. I didn't know the importance of thinking about the future. When I came to understand the importance of it, through looking at our older generation, mm. then I understood the value of it today. So I think the challenge or the the obstacle we face is ignorance and we have to take responsibility to go and find the answers, go and educate ourselves about uh, the, our situation and our future generation's mm -hmm. situation too. Oh, okay, yeah. I see. And like for those that maybe feel that I started saving late mm -hmm. or for my retirement or for anything, like mm -hmm. what advice would you actually give them for them to be able maybe to catch up or mm -hmm. for them to be able to continue and all that? Mm -hmm. I would say that it doesn't matter mm -hmm. what hand we are dealt, figuratively speaking. Whether it's um, we started, we had to fight the first few lives, first few years of our lives mm -hmm. just to survive, um, or we started off with a good hand. You can be the person who started off late can still be in a better position than the person who didn't have to fight, mm -hmm. depending on how consistent and how dedicated they are towards that goal. So many of us start late. But late is better than never. Mm. So I would encourage someone, just start and, let, and as time goes by, you can see how you can increase your contribution. Maybe you want to start a business as well. And a business vehicle will enable you to bring in more than a normal fixed job. So you may be better off if that is the route that you want to take. Obviously there's more risk in that route. So I would say, Developing the financial habits um, is fundamental mm -hmm. and then you can, you can make up for it depending on the path you want to take or if you don't change the path, you will still be better off than someone who... I mean, there's, there are people today that 
are 50, 60 that don't have retirement. Plans. Anything Thank saved you. up. And I would rather be in a position where I have a little bit than nothing. Than nothing. So yeah. I would say, whether it's late, still start, you'll still be in a better position. Mm. That's actually true. So yeah, one is to move to building wealth and investments. Mm. So what strategies will you um, give for wealth building, um, especially in the African perspective or in the African mm. context? I would say that each one, depending upon the stage that we are in our lives, whether it be a young person, mm. mid, uh, like 30, 40 or 60 or whatever it may be, yeah. your risk, your profile will be different. And because your, your profile is different, that will then determine your strategy, meaning how aggressive, which funds you're going to invest in. Uh, if you are a bit older, um, and then you need to look at conservative funds, like something that's not too risky. Yeah. So I, I would say the strategy will depend upon who the person is, where they are, what their goal is. That's where financial advisors come into play, and financial planners, wealth planners. It's where we're able to see where are you now, where do you want to be, let's make a tailored plan for you. So the strategy is not a one-size-fits-all. It's more where do you want to be, mm -hmm. and then let's make that happen. Okay, so for somebody who is like totally new to investing, what is investing and what are the practical steps that I can take mm -hmm. for me to start investing and why is it even important? Mm -hmm. um, why is it important? Mm -hmm. If we start there, I would say your if your financial future is important to you, then that's enough reason. To not want to be in a position of lack then I would say it's important to pay attention to financial planning or investments. Mm -hmm. In terms of the strategies, on the other hand, if you don't worry about financial planning and future, mm -hmm. then I wouldn't, I wouldn't even bother, like, why? It's not, you're not concerned about it. Mm -hmm. not, no one is forced to prioritize it. Mm -hmm. In terms of the investment and uh, vehicles and how to go about building wealth, I would say, Firstly, developing the habit of saving and then you look at what vehicle am I going to invest in. Mm -hmm. So once you have the habit, then you just look at which vehicle am I going to choose. And depending on the, the vehicle, uh, that is how you are able to determine your, your rate of return of the investments. Um, if you go to any of these financial institutions, you will also find they have an investment plan, which you can start off with a few hundred dollars as well, a million dollars. Mm. And I would say, just start there. Whether it be 200 million dollars, mm. start there, you are investing. And then take that, and you can ask the financial advisor or planner and say, can you invest this into the property portfolio? Now, with 300 to 500 Namibian dollars, mm -hmm. you are investing in property. Because mm -hmm. the financial institutions has yeah. put together funds that enables anyone mm -hmm. to participate in the, the increase of the property sector. Um, okay, I see. Ash. But yeah, <laughs> we will get there. So like how can people maybe like evaluate risk um, and return when making investment decision, particularly in emerging markets like Africa? Mm. Is it it's about risk, right? Yeah, risk. I would say risk analysis or a risk profile, to know your risk profile, mm. it will require you to speak to a financial advisor or um, someone who understands how to identify your risk profile and also understand what are the different vehicles and the levels of risk yeah. associated with them. Um, I would come back to the, the idea that I'm, I shared earlier about 
if you have a toothache, you would go to a dentist. Yeah. If you have a headache or a body ache, you would go to a doctor. And I would apply the same principle and say, don't try and pull out your own teeth. Don't try and um, operate on yourself, uh, but go and seek advice and guidance. So if, and I've made this mistake myself, that's why I'm saying this. So if I want to identify my risk profile and then I also identify what vehicles is suitable, then I can also make very big mistakes. Mm. And I may even, some people just go into, um, I don't know, stocks mm. and they may go into uh, play on the stock exchange or they busy with Forex. But in reality, this person needs to save funds. They need to have a family to take care of. Mm. They, need, they need to have low risk yeah. vehicles. But going into the forex market is where they can lose, it's high risk. So it's then they get burnt and then they say, no, I'm not going to do that again. But it came from a lack of knowing your risk profile mm. and the risk, um, like knowing the different vehicles and their risk. Mm -hmm. So I would come back to it and say, let's find someone who knows and then they can teach you and then you are able to understand your your risk profile and the vehicles at your disposal um nathan how would you describe the financial landscape of namibia compared to other african countries financial landscape yeah there's a lot to say on that question um I would say that the, the word that comes to mind if I compare Africa mm. is there's a lot of room for development and if I look abroad they are looking for room of development so they will come here mm. like the green hydrogen yeah. and the, the oil and the, the various things that we have that people abroad do not have. Mm. So if our eyes are open to the future of Africa, mm. then we will begin equipping ourselves to benefit from the development of the African continent. Mm. Um, in terms of abroad, a lot of development has already taken place. Um, and that is why they are looking to sustain their current economy by, by bringing in like money from abroad. Mm -hmm. So I would say um, on a very basic level, our landscape or our, the word that sticks out in my mind is so much opportunity. Mm -hmm. If a student is watching this now, and they look at the landscape and the future of Namibia or Africa yeah. and they see in the next five years green hydrogen is going to take off mm. oil they, then they can look at the other countries um, Dubai, Saudi Arabia and look at their oil industry and look at what is the key roles that is required to develop that to sustain and develop that industry because currently we haven't build out that sector yet mm -hmm. and then begin studying three four years down the line you're done you're an expert in the field yeah you would be the only one in africa or namibia with that skill set and automatically you will be in a position where you can contribute to the economy on a on a in a again exponential level mm -hmm. yeah so i would i would highlight that Point. Point. Okay. So uh, that actually just remind me, like there is a discussion. I like there was a point that was mentioned that everybody else has plans and solutions for Africa, except the Africans themselves. No. So I'm like, yeah. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. <laughs> yeah, it's very heartbreaking. And I'm actually now this makes me curious. Like as a country, maybe as Namibia or maybe South Africa, how do we find ourselves like in debt? Maybe if like it's just if you have a mm. perspective on that, how do we find ourselves in debt? And like, what do you think our governments or our leaderships are like are not doing? 
in terms of the financial aspect? I think debt, if you, if you do the comparison mm -hmm. between a country and individual, yeah. why would an individual find themselves in debt? It's like maybe a not knowing how to manage resources mm -hmm. efficiently and not knowing how to provide value to the society. Mm -hmm. I would say on a simplistic level, it may be the same. Um, managing a country's resources, mm -hmm. it's a very big job. Mm -hmm. And our leaders of the country um, are managing resources that has been coming along for decades. Mm -hmm. And I would say that on a country level, if we know our resources and we have co correct management of that resources, as well as position ourselves in the global society to benefit and bring money into the country and then managing that money properly mm -hmm. so that we are able to grow the economy, then we can find ourselves not being in debt or taking on debt as much as we, we may have. So I would say the financial, there are financial principles that are universal whether it be from an individual or an entity or a country. Mm -hmm. It's like providing value, money management, reinvesting in um, the development of the country, like what Dubai did, for example. Mm. The amount of investment they put into the, the country mm. is like it has yielded so much more. People want to go there. Yeah whether it be for business, for travel, it's just like they've invested so much to make it so valuable that it brings in money from all across the world. Mm -hmm. So I would say um, the principle is universal. Providing value, managing money, reinvesting will put us in a position where we are not in need to take on debt, mm -hmm. but we can actually provide more value um, to like yeah. diminish the debt. I see. So a country can also, it's, it's like also a business in a way? I like would, a company? I would use the word organization. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is what will, the similarities you can draw from a country. Uh, there are presidents in the past, uh, there are presidents who come from a business background. Yeah. And that principles of managing a business successfully would also then be brought over to managing a country successfully. So I would definitely say we can learn, as a country, we can learn from the business principles mm. or management of organizations. Okay, I see. So how can Namibians and other Africans, um, in like in other Africans in similar African economic space level, like leverage, local financial opportunities for growth? I think what you're touching on now, it's very important, very big. Um, lo knowing firstly what opportunities there are, will know the individual, how can I set myself up to make use of this opportunity? Mm -hmm. If, like example, if you have uh, if you look at the stats, yeah. digital marketing and the digital and audience is growing and the newspaper audience is shrinking mm. kind of thing. Yeah. So knowing that is I can equip myself to study something like, or even if it's not institutional studies, mm. but just educating myself on how to provide digital marketing services. Mm. And then I can take that leap while I'm still in school or working to provide digital marketing services. So I believe your question was, how can we make use of the opportunities yeah. that we have here in Africa? First point is to become aware of the opportunities. Then make myself fit for that opportunity. It's like every door has a key. Mm. So if there's digital marketing, what is the need? What is the key? Yeah. How can I upscale myself to fit the development of this industry going forward and that is how I believe we'll be able to make use of the opportunities. Uh, I think um, we 
we may have come across people who says, yes, there's so much opportunities, but it's being given to other people. Yeah. But if I make myself the best candidate for that position, I may not get in that industry. Mm -hmm. I may not get this door open. That, but if I keep on knocking, I'm going to be the best candidate for the job. And I may, I will be in a better position to get or get a foot in the door. Mm -hmm. And if it's not to get a job in a company in the industry, then I can also start a company to provide the service in yeah. the industry. So knowing what positions, what opportunities are there, mm -hmm. making myself fit to receive that opportunity, yeah. or even going one step further and grabbing the opportunity with both hands mm -hmm. and not waiting for someone to, to give it to me. Yeah. That's actually right. So what will you what will it be your best financial piece of advice that you will give somebody or anybody that they can actually like follow? Mm. I would say self education. Honestly, self education, best advice. Mm. Understand your 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 money psychology, how you view money. Mm -hmm. Understand how money what money is. Because what money is now is not what money was a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. It's paper asset. It's, it's paper today. Mm -hmm. Back then it was like hard assets. Yeah. Understand the flow of money in the economy. This is very important. Uh, you, you cannot start a, a hot dog stand if there's no one around. Money is not flowing there. So if you look in the Namibian economy and you see R, ah, in the Namibian economy, there's a lot of construction taking place. Then I can position myself in that industry to then make use of that. So I would say self-education first is the financial education, first point. And then knowing how the money flows in society, positioning yourself on the receiving end. It's going to go into people's pockets whether you like it or not. It's just not going into your pocket because you haven't positioned yourself there. Mm -hmm. So it's like water is flowing. Yeah. But are you where the water it's is flowing? Swimming. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense actually. And really relatable. So like what legacy would you like actually to leave behind in the financial advisory field? Sure, there's a... I would like to leave... Uh, I would like to change the future of our continent mm. in terms of being a, a with our resources and our work ethic I believe we will be able to establish ourselves as a global force to be reckoned with so what I hope to achieve is to bring us closer to that through education and I believe that educating and help and opening people's eyes up to the opportunities that's out there brings them closer to make use of that opportunities. Mm -hmm. So if we have 90% um, of businesses fail, yeah. for example, mm -hmm. if we can educate, if I can help bridge the gap of moving from registering a business to a business being successful in its fifth and tenth year, yeah. then I would feel I have done what I want to do in the financial industry. Because a business that's five or ten years old will be able to contribute to the overall economy mm -hmm. on a long-term basis. Mm -hmm. So if I can lower the, the rate of business failure, then I would be very happy. Uh, if, if, if the new statistic can mm -hmm. be businesses fail 50% of the time and not 90% of the time, yeah. then I would be absolutely um, over the moon. Okay, great to hear that. So is there anything else that I have left out that we kind of like want to tackle that I haven't maybe asked you? I think you've touched on it now. Mm -hmm. My vision, my goal, my mission mm -hmm. um, is to leave an impact in the African um, market mm -hmm. and for the future Africans that we 
we have yeah. and I believe that how I am I can contribute how I'm going to do that is by working with business owners um, currently my focus is financial education towards business owners yeah. because the business owners are those who are able to bring a tangible impact within the glo in the African economy mm -hmm. um, if you look at our unemployment rate, yeah. just hypothetically mm -hmm. speaking, people are unemployed because they are not employed by a business or something. Yeah. Think about it. We have a, a thousand, let's make it a hundred thousand businesses mm -hmm. for argument's sake. Okay. And mm -hmm. each business employs one person. What would happen to our unemployment rate if a hundred thousand people gets a job tomorrow? It will drop. Our, our unemployment will drop completely. Yeah, yeah. And we are at a much better advantage than other countries with a bigger population. Mm -hmm. So we will be able to drop the unemployment rate in a much shorter time if we are able to stabilize the, the development and the, the growth of business in the five to ten year gap. So my intention yeah. is to help business owners get over that five, ten year um, learning and stabilizing themselves uh -huh. so that long, medium to long term, as a country and as a continent, we are able to grow the economy. And I believe businesses or business owners or are the, the ones who can bring practical change mm. in the future of our country. Interesting. So what did you say is the number one factor or one of the factors that actually contribute to the failure of the startups? Statistically, it's cash flow management. It's like um, the management of the, firstly, knowing which market you are in. If you are in a market that's declining, then your business is not going to succeed. If I'm selling something or providing a service that's not needed, mm -hmm. it's not going to, there's no market. Like, it's not going to grow. Mm -hmm. It may grow here and there, yeah. but sustainably and growth-wise, the market is not there for it. Mm -hmm. um, then once you are in that market, that is, once you find a market, that is growing then managing your cash mm -hmm. and then once you manage your cash reinvest into the business so that you are able to grow and I, so I would say um, market um, cash flow management yeah. uh, reinvesting and yeah and, and having the knowledge the understanding of how to get to that place Quite interesting. Thank you so much, Nathan, for coming on Africa Speak. Is there any last words that you would love to say before I actually let you go? Yeah, um, I would say that thank you for having me on here. <laughs> I believe the time we have spent here has given one, even one or a few people a better understanding of their finances mm. or, or their generational finances, then mm. I am happy for that. And then also to the business owners out there that mm. we have a responsibility. Mm. It may not feel like a risk. We may see it as feeding our family, yeah. but we also have the opportunity to change the nation. Mm -hmm. It's literally in, our, in the palm of our hands. And if we are able to understand the opportunities, the resources, what needs to be educated, yeah. then we will be able to take the country and the continent to a place that has never been reached before. Hmm. Interesting. And how can people actually connect with you? Currently, I would say at the bottom of my uh, socials, mm. there's a, a link in bio, just something mm. I put there where people can just message according to their interests. Mm. And then myself and the team will be able to set up a meeting. Um, currently, we are looking, we're working with uh, like a initial meeting or a strategy meeting mm. is completely free. 
it costs um, business owners and people nothing to do that, is where we see if we can actually work together. Mm -hmm. If we can provide you with the path and the resources. Mm -hmm. If we can't, if, if in that first meeting we can't do so, we say, okay, we'll point you in the right direction. Mm -hmm. But so yeah, at the bottom of my social, I think I'll have a link in bio. Okay, which social is that? Instagram, Facebook. It will be Instagram mm -hmm. uh, and LinkedIn, and yeah, that's. Okay. I'm not very active on social media oh, as okay. yet. Oh, okay, Nathan Klassen. Yeah, Nathan Klassen or Nate Class. Or oh, Nate Class. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. We will also put your links in the description just for people to kind of easier find you as well. Mm. So yeah, thank you so much. This actually brings us to the end of the cool. interview. Thanks for having me. Yes.